A large amount of coding involves adapting the code written by other people. It's quite rare to write all of your code from scratch, particularly as a journalist, without actually taking ideas or sections of code from elsewhere. In this video, I'm going to talk about how you can adapt some code that I'm going to provide to you. And along the way, we're going to focus on using that code to extract information from a web page, in other words, scraping, and how to store that information as data as well. This is building on some of the work that we've covered in previous videos. And as I say, this is based on some code that I've provided to you in the form of this notebook. Now, you can see that um, this notebook has a number of blocks of code like this with little buttons on the left to run each bit of code and also some explanation between those blocks of code as well. So it's well worth reading the explanation as well as you work through the code that I'm going to explain in this video. Between the notebook and this video, you should have a good basis for starting to create scrapers yourself in Python. So that's the code. What's the journalistic scenario? Well, it's quite a simple one. I'm going to basically scrape a website on karting. Um, let's say that we're interested in diversity in the racing industry, in the, in the sport of racing. How easy is it for people to get access to karting tracks and begin their journey towards um, success in a sport like Formula One? Which parts of the country have less access to go-karting? Well, in order to answer that question, we'd need to build a data set telling us where the go-karting tracks are in the UK. And in order to do that, we might start to look for sources, ideally some sort of comprehensive directory of those tracks. And this looks like the sort of thing we might want to scrape. It's got the locations of different tracks and lots of details about them, but particularly the address. So that's what we're going to set out to scrape. So let's look at our code. Before we can even begin to do all of that, we're going to need what are called libraries. A library in Python is basically a collection of code. Specifically, it's a collection of functions which uh, we can use to tackle different types of challenges. In this first block of code here, we install four different libraries that are often used in scraping. Now, before I even begin to explain this code, it's worth pointing out that you can use this code yourself without ever having to change it. This code will pretty much remain the same in most situations when it comes to scraping. In Python, you install a library with the word import, followed by the name of the library. And you can see the four libraries that we have here are ScraperWiki, which is used to fetch pages from URLs, lxml.html, which is used to convert that scraped web page into something a bit more structured, so we can drill down into it, CSS Select, is the third library, and that allows us to select different parts of a scraped web page based on the HTML tags. And finally, Pandas. Uh, Pandas is a library which is used to create um, data frames and tables and export those results. So we're going to need that to deal with the challenge of um, storing our data in a structured form. A couple of other things to point out here. You might notice that in the case of two of these libraries, we've had to include an extra line of code which starts with exclamation mark pip install. What's happening here is for these two libraries, we need to install the library within Google Colab. For the other two libraries, we don't need to do that because Google Colab already comes with Pandas and LXML HTML installed. So that's why we've got uh, the pip install in there. And then finally, one other thing to point out is with Pandas, we give it a, a, a kind of a different name. We call it PD. So we import Pandas as PD. 
All that that means is that we've um, given it a name that we can use later, which is going to be quicker to type than pandas. And that's quite common. It's quite typical when people use pandas in particular. So that section of code is installing the libraries, or importing the libraries, I should say. Now let's move on to the next block of code. In this block, uh, this should look a lot more familiar. This involves us creating a list and storing it in a variable. The list is a list of county names, and we've stored those in a variable called counties. And the reason we're creating a list of those county names is because if we go to this website and look at the, just going to move this along a little bit. If you look at the directory here, we've got Avon, we've got Bedfordshire, Berkshire. And when we click on each of those, so if I click on Avon, then I'm just going to move this window around so you can see the address we can see that the address ends in Avon. Um, if we go to um, Bedfordshire, we can see that it ends in Bedfordshire and so on. So if we have a list of these uh, words, Avon, Bedfordshire, Berkshire, Birmingham and so on, then we can cycle through those and add it to this basic URL to create a bunch of different URLs that we want to scrape. And that's what we start to move towards in the next line of code, which is where we store that basic URL. So in this case, we've um, stored the name of the URL of a, the list of characters that make up that URL, the string, in another variable called base URL. So if I run that code, you won't see anything happening because there's no print command here, but we've now created a list variable and a string variable. In the next bit of code, we're going to combine those two to start to generate our list of URLs. We're only using four to begin with just to demonstrate this in principle. Obviously, you would want a list of all of these counties to do this properly. So here's our next block of code and here we encounter that for loop that I mentioned in a previous video. So we're going to loop through the counties list, the, the variable counties which contains the four items and one of the nice things about uh, notebooks is that if I hover over that variable it actually does show what's inside it and that it's a list. So I'm going to loop through that list. I'm going to kick, call each item county as, it, as I go through. And then while it's looping, I'm going to take that item county and I'm going to add it to the variable base URL. There we go. We can see it's a string. And I'm going to store the results in full URL, a new variable. Then I'm going to print it. So if I run that code now, you'll see... The first time it loops, it's going to grab Avon, put it on the end of this URL, store it in full URL, and then print it out. The next time, it's going to do the same with Bedfordshire, and here it prints out. Then with Berkshire, print it out. Then with Birmingham. So we've got the four lines here for each time that that loop has run. So we can see that this loop works. It um, takes each of these words, adds it to a URL, and we can even click on that link to check that it's a working link. Now that we've tested that theory, if we, you know, we tested that it works, we can start to extend this loop to start to scrape each of these URLs rather than just printing them. So here's that next block of code. You'll see the first few lines are the same again. But now we've added quite a lot of other lines as well, including another for loop, which is nested inside this one. So let's go through each of those lines in turn. First of all, the libraries that we imported right at the start, now those libraries start to become used. The first library that we use is the scraper wiki library. 
and we're using a function from that called scrape. So scraper wiki dot scrape means use um, the scrape like a function from the scraper wiki library. Now every function is followed by some brackets that contain its ingredients and the ingredient that we're giving here is that URL, the full URL that we formed by combining the two other elements. So the scrape function basically scrapes um, a URL. It goes to a, an address that you specify and it fetches the entire page. But we need to be able to store that somewhere in our code. So what this line does is create a new variable, which we call HTML, which just tells us that this is some HTML. And we assign to that variable the results of running that scrape function on that URL. Now, once we've stored that, we then use that in the next line of code here, which uses a second library, lxml.html. And this time it's a function called from string. Now, from string converts this HTML web page into something that's a bit more structured, what you might call a, a, an LXML object. And again, we need to store that somehow. So we create a variable here called root. And root is given the results of running this function on this variable. So we're going from this um, series of counties to creating URLs to scraping the web page of that URL to converting it to something that's a bit more structured. All of these lines of code you don't really need to change. But the next line you do, and in this next line, this is where we specify the particular part of a web page that we want to grab. So far we've grabbed the whole of a web page, but we only want a specific piece of information, the address. And what we're looking for is a particular HTML tag. So if I go to one of the pages, let's find this one. And this is the information we want, the address. One quite useful way to find out what HTML tags are used around this address is to right click on it and go to inspect in Google Chrome. And this should show us the HTML around that text. So we can see that there's the address, but also on either side of it, a H3 tag and a closing H3 tag. So if we want to just grab this piece of information, we can use this H3 tag to target that and say that that's what we want to extract. And by the way, we can also check if there's anything else using this tag by looking at the source of a page. So if I go to view page source, and then if I do a find and look for H3, I can see that there are four instances of it. There's one address, there's another address, there's another one, and a fourth one. So I can double check um, that these tags are only used for the information that I want. Back in the code then, that H3 is used as what's called a selector to grab just the contents of those H3 tags, those HTML tags. And this time we're using that CSS select library that I mentioned earlier um, to select those tags. And it's using that root variable as well. The construction of this line is a little bit different to the previous lines. So the, the root here is obviously the same as the root ver. This is a variable. And this function has been applied to it using this full stop. Again, the results of doing that are stored in this variable that we create that we're going to call titles. In fact, we might call it addresses. Now, I said this line is important because it this is one line that you might need to adapt. So if your data is in a different tag, you would put something different to H3 there. But the rest of the line can stay the same. Now I've changed address, I've changed um, the name of a variable from titles to addresses, so I'm going to need to change it here as well. 
and we're going to loop through that list and uh, grab these four different items. Or in fact, we're going to grab whichever items are on the page because we're going to do this on a number of different pages, not just this one that I was looking at just now. Now, one key thing to remember with CSS Select is that the result of running this is always going to be a list. Even if it finds just one item, just one match, that will still be a list of one. If it finds zero matches, it will be an empty list, a list of zero. But the results will always be a list variable. So addresses is going to be a list variable. And I've intentionally given it a plural name to indicate that. Now, because it's a list variable, we're going to need to loop through it to get each address that we've stored, even if there's only one or none at all. So in the next line, we start that loop with the word for, and then with in addresses at the end, the name of the, li of the list, and we've, we're calling each item i, which is a convention in coding. Then we've got a colon at the end, and then we've got what happens within this loop. And what happens is a couple of things. First of all, we print this item, we print the, the part of the list that's been looped through. Then we print, uh, then we do something else, we grab something else, and then we print that thing that we've just grabbed. Now, in terms of the, um, in terms of this line of code, it's probably best if I run this code to explain what this text content is. So let's run it. Okay. So what we've got here are three different lines um, which are being printed. And if we look in the code here, we can see there's the first print command, full URL. So that's the, the URL that's being scraped. Then down here, we've got print I. And that corresponds to this line here, element h3 at, and then a whole line of characters. And then the third print is this title, so this text content, and that's the address. So we already know what this full URL is here, but I want to focus on these other two print commands and this uh, text content function that I mentioned as well. Now, when you use CSS select to select the, co the contents of different HTML tags, the results look like this. They're not something that you can read, that a human can read. They are um, a, a type of object, essentially, that has all sorts of different pieces of information. If you can imagine grabbing a HTML tag, you're actually grabbing a number of different things. You're grabbing the tag itself, the text inside it. Um, there might be attributes as well to that tag as well. So if you think of that as some sort of object, that's what this object looks like in its raw form. Element h3 at blah, blah, blah. That's not very useful to us. In order to drill down further and get to the specific text inside that tag or other properties of it, then we need to use some additional code. And that's what this is. Putting dot text underscore content, open close brackets, after the name of the uh, variable containing this, basically extracts the text content. So in order to get the text inside the um, this CSS select result, we need to use dot text content. And what's happening here is that's being grabbed from the item, stored in a variable called title, we can call it address instead, and printed. Now, I'm going to run this code again, just check that it's still working, now that I've changed these names. But also, I want to draw attention to the fact that we've got two for loops, one here, and then within that, another one here. So this is, this is called a nested 
for loop, it's a for loop within another. And if you look at the results, you can see how that works in practice. So for this URL, we've only got one address. So this nested for loop only runs once. The same for Bedfordshire and the same for Berkshire. But for Birmingham, we can see it loops one, two, three, four times inside the Birmingham loop. So that's taken us a little bit closer. We've now um, looped through a number of uh, county names. We've created a URL from those. We then scraped the web page at that URL. We've converted it to um, an object that's a bit more structured. We've drilled down into the contents of a particular tag, which has created a list of matches. And then we've looped through those matches and drilled down even further into the text content inside that HTML tag and printed that out. The next stage then is to actually store this information so that we can download it and use it in our journalism. So here we go. Um, now we're using the, the one library that's left that we've not used so far, which is Pandas. And you'll remember when we imported Pandas, we imported it as PD. So that's what the PD is here. That's basically Pandas. And again, very handily in the notebook, it can tell us when we hover over it. And we're using a function from that library called DataFrame. Data frame is a function that's used to create a data frame, basically a table. So we're going to, so before we even start the scraper, we're going to create this empty data frame that's going to be ready to store the results once we get them. And when we use the data frame function, it has um, some ingredients, just one ingredient, which is what are the columns for this new table, this new data frame. And you'll notice that the columns are specified with a list. You have a list of columns because of the square brackets. That's how we know it's a list. In this case, it's a list of one item, which is the name title. So we're going to have one column in this data frame, and it's going to be called title. Once that data frame is created with the single column, it's stored in a new variable that we call df. So we've now got this empty data frame with one column. Now the loop starts again. And again, all this code is the same. I'm going to change titles to addresses and, a, and title to address. And I'm going to do it like this. So all the code is the same up until the point where we printed the address. The only other new code is right at the end, which is where we store this address inside our data frame. And we do that by basically um, taking that data frame and using a function called append. Now, you might be able to guess that append is a function that adds a new, adds something to, um, in this case, a data frame. So it's going to add a new row of data to this data frame, df. And the data that it's going to add comes in um, this particular shape. So we've got uh, essentially a label and a value. Now, the value is this address that we stored earlier. The label is the name of a column. And at this point, I've realized that because I've changed it here, I'm going to have to change it here as well. So this, these two correspond to each other. We've got this empty data frame with one column, and it's called location. And down here, we're putting the address, this variable here, into that column, essentially or we're giving it a name that matches that column. 
So that's the main ingredient of this append. We're going to add this to our data frame. There's also another piece of information here, which is uh, ignore index equals true. We've just I've just added that because what that will do is basically not treat our one column of data as um, an index, but where you can't have the same value twice. I'm going to, uh, this is basically my way of saying I'm happy for, for the same information to appear more than once in my data. So again, you can leave all this code as it is, but um, if you've changed this word address, you just need to change it here as well. And you might want to give your column a different name to location if you're storing something else or want to label it differently. And you just need to make sure you change that in both places, ver and ver. Now the result of doing all of that, of appending that row to that data frame, is then put in the same variable. So essentially we're overwriting that data frame with the new version. And that's how we go from having an empty frame, empty data frame, to one that's got one record, and then it will have two, and so on. As it loops through over and over again, it's going to keep appending rows to this data frame and replacing the old data frame with it. So if I run that now, it's still printing as it goes, and it's not generating any errors, so that's good. Um, let me just, I'm going to change this back to title and see what happens if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't realized my potential mistake. Ah, that's interesting, it does still work. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, so let me scroll down a little bit further to the next bit of code, which is to print that data frame. So let's see what happened. Here we go. Now we can see we've got the location here and we've also got this title column, which has got nothing in it. So basically when it's appended, it's um, created an extra column. That's all that it's done. But it's worked. It's saved the information that I wanted, that I scraped. All that's left now is for me to export it and get it out of this notebook. Now Pandas has um, another function called toCSV which will convert a data frame to a CSV file and um, to use that function you need to do two things. The first is you need to attach it to the data frame that you want to convert. Well you're not converting, you're essentially exporting it. Uh, you attach it by a period. So df is the name of my variable that has that data frame in it. So I put a full stop after that with no spaces and then two underscore CSV followed by some brackets. The second ingredient is inside the brackets and that's the name of the file, the name that you want to give the file, the CSV that you are creating. So make sure that that ends in .csv and you can call it whatever you want. I've called it scraped data. When you run that, it will create that file, but where's it gone? Well, it's in the files folder on the left here. In Google Colab, any files that you're working with are in this folder. And if you click on that button on the left, you should see a little explorer open up with any files that you've created or imported over there. So you should now see the file that you exported and you can download it by clicking on these three dots next to it and selecting download and it will quickly download. Let's just open that up as well so you can see what it looks like. There we go. There's our data. And this row of numbers, these are the indexes or the indices that have been created at the same time. So this is what's created when you, um, if I go back up the code, let's just close that again. Uh, this bit, ignore index equals true, that basically means that you end up with a column of numbers that are used instead as an index. So that takes you through all of the code that I've provided and the code that you can adapt yourself.
The key things here to remember are, first of all, that most of a chord can be left as it is. You don't need to adapt most of a chord. So a lot of the heavy lifting, if you like, has been done for you. Where you need to focus your attention uh, is on the specific lines that are going to be specific to your scraper. And there are a couple in particular that um, I'm going to draw your attention to. So let's go back up to the full chord. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go right up to the start. So the, the first thing that you will need to adapt is this part here. Um, obviously, you are probably not going to be scraping the go-karting website, so you're going to need a different base URL, and you're going to need a different list of words that are going to be added to that. Um, that's if you are creating a scraper that works like this. Alternatively, if you just have a list of URLs, then you will loop through that list instead. So in this part here, you probably wouldn't uh, combine anything. You would just loop through a list and then you would use the, um, the item in the list instead of full URL here. So that's the first thing you're going to need to adapt. The second thing you're going to need to adapt is the HTML tag that you're targeting on the page. Now, we've used a very simple one here, H3. To target the tag H3, you simply put H3 in uh, quotation marks or inverted commas inside these brackets here. But um, you can specify multiple tags. So if I wanted to target any A tag inside a H2 tag, that's how I would describe it. You put one tag after the other with a space in between. So you can specify a combination of tags, tags that are nested inside each other. You can also specify the properties of tags as well. So I might um, only want to target um, A tags with a particular um, attribute or image tags with a particular attribute or um, paragraph tags with a particular class. When you start to get into those more specific selectors, it's worth reading about CSS selectors and how they are used to select different HTML tags. And you'll find some tips in this notebook that, uh, that you've been provided with. So that's the second thing is the tags. And then finally, as I mentioned, the other thing you may want to uh, customize is, if I can find the section of card, um, is this data frame. So is your data frame going to have multiple columns? So we might have a title, location, phone. I might have three columns in this data frame. And then down here, you might need to store those different items as well. And of course, you would also need, oops, you would also need those to be created. So we'd need some sort of phone number here, or we'd need to be grabbing it from the page. So I'm not getting um, too bogged down in all specifics right now. All I want to focus on at the moment is, first of all, this idea of adapting code. Second of all, um, how you import libraries. Thirdly, I want you to be thinking about selectors and how you select items from a page, and then how you store that in a data frame and uh, download it afterwards. Understanding those basics gives you a foundation to then start to learn more about the different aspects of scraping. So you can start to learn more about using selectors. Um, you can start to experiment with grabbing multiple pieces of information from a page. You can tackle different challenges in terms of how the 
URLs are organized, whether they're using numbers, for example, or whether you have a list of URLs instead. Those give you different challenges to work with. And at the bottom of this notebook, you'll find, as I mentioned, the guidelines about um, CSS selectors, different ways of generating URLs for a scraper to loop through, um, some tips involved in that, errors to avoid. And you'll also find some other example scrapers on um, GitHub, on the folder for this module around Python. Um, and you can adapt those notebooks as well for other situations that you may want to tackle with a scraper. But even if you never do scraping again, what you should have here is a really good understanding of how scrapers work in order, in order to communicate with developers or other people who might be writing scrapers or working with you on a scraping project. Now, I do want to quickly um, talk about dictionaries again because this is a, a type of data that we've touched on in this video. Um, and just to recap some basics on that as well, a dictionary is basically like a list, but instead of being a list of items, it's a list of pairs. Unlike a list, it uses curly brackets instead of square brackets. And those pairs are separated by a colon. On the left hand side of the colon is the key, basically like a column heading. And on the right hand is the value. So that might be a string or a number or a variable or something like that. And dictionaries are often used to store data and they're particularly useful in scraping for that reason. So I'm going to leave it there. Have a look at the code in the notebook. Try running that code, try adapting it a little bit. Um, see how much you can understand, see which areas you maybe don't understand and need help with. And we'll um, review a lot of this in the class um, in the class for this week. I'll see you there.